This morning we begin our time of worship with greeting one another and then also lighting the candle to remember the places in our country, in our world, where people are living in violence, especially in Gaza and Ukraine. Let the people who have gathered remember that each cell in God's creation calls us to celebrate this day. Each cell within us responds with uplifting joy. We arise as we are renewed into the whirling dance of worship. We join the movement of ages and connect the past to now and this time of praise and reflection with the assurance of the divine spirit's love. Let us worship God. I invite you to join us and stand as you're able. This is not our typical hymn, so we're going to sing it through twice. The second time we invite you to move and clap with us. Come out, come out of your comfortable spaces. Come meet Jesus in the difficult places. Have you not heard every valley's exalted? Mountains made low, but the lowly are lifted. Come out, come out of your well-to-do places. Come meet Jesus in the struggling spaces. Come out, the kingdom of God is upon us. Come out, the wilderness, follow Jesus. young in body, mind, spirit, all of the above or none. If you would like to make your way to the front of the sanctuary. Hello, Q. Hello, Isaiah. Hello, Finn. Hello, Caleb. Hello, Via. Hello, Theo. Hello, everybody. Thank you. I like my shirt too. <laughs> so today, how many of us know that we need to respect our parents? You do a lot. Yeah, sometimes we all make mistakes respecting our parents, don't we? <laughs> Well, that's a different service. How about that? <laughs> and it, the fun thing about the Bible actually is that it says to respect your parents, but it also says that your parents should respect you. And so you need to remember that respect is a two-way street. When you give respect, you should expect respect back. And parents should give that to you. And you know, sometimes if you want to stay up till 3 a.m. doing something you shouldn't be doing, you should go to bed. <laughs> but sometimes no means no. But sometimes no means no. They're having a sibling moment and I relate. <laughs> so how, can you think of times when 
you want respect and you feel like you don't get it from parents or adults around you. I can think of a example when I was younger and I felt like I didn't get respect. I, I used to love only playing imagination. I didn't like toys. And I had a kindergarten teacher who made me play with toys. I don't, it was the weirdest thing. And I told her, please, I don't want to use toys. And she was like, you're going to use the toys. <laughs> and that made me feel not very respected. Yeah, playing is just great in general. But remember always that when you give respect, you should get respect back. So let's bow our heads in prayer today and repeat after me. God, we pray to you that we always get the respect that we give. May we always be safe in your love and protection and by your grace it is so amen you may all go to the sunday room Our first scripture today comes from the book of Acts in the 10th chapter, and we hear about how the Gentiles receive the Holy Spirit. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Buenos días. La escritura hoy es de Hechos 10, 44 hasta 48. Mientras Pedro estaba todavía hablando, el Espíritu Santo descendió sobre todos los que escuchaban la, el mensaje. Los creyentes judíos que habían llegado con Pedro se quedaron asombrados de que el don del Espíritu Santo se hubiera derramado también sobre los no judíos. 
pues los oían hablar en lenguas y alabar a Dios. Entonces Pedro respondió, ¿Acá se puede alguien negar el agua para que sean bautizados estos que han recibido el, el Espíritu Santo, lo mismo como nosotros? Y mandó que fueran bautizadas en el nombre de Jesucristo. Entonces le pidieran que se quedara con ellos algunos días. La palabra de Dios para el pueblo de Dios. Gracias a Dios. John 15, verses 9 through 17. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friend. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I've been settling into my new title these past couple of months, and it's been interesting, to say the least. Mind you, I don't go around telling people to call me reverend, <laughs> but when people ask what I do, I tell them. You get a number of different reactions. We are blessed to have a congregation full of clergy, and I'm sure you can all relate. Some people immediately stiffen up. They stand up straighter, apologize for some reason, and for some obscure sin that they committed in the summer of 2016 <laughs> after too many mojitos on a beach in Tijuana, Mexico. <laughs> that was a Cinco de Mayo joke. <laughs> While others immediately start launching into the most complicated theological questions you've ever heard in your life, interviewing you newscaster style. Sir, Explain the heresy of Pelagianism and its ramifications on Calvinist determinism and modern American politics. Okay. <laughs> Those are all relatively mild reactions, but there is one reaction in particular that actually breaks my heart, and that reaction is anger. I'm not talking about explosive, dramatic, in-your-face anger either, though that can be the case sometimes. I'm talking about a bitter, sardonic, cold anger that leaves you wondering, what did I ever do to you? And it's never for anything that we did, but typically for what God has not done in the lives of these people. Because behind the anger of almost every person who derides others, who believe, who sneer at the sound of prayer and songs of worship, is the neglected spirit of a child whose prayers were never heard who saw Santa Claus take off his beard after coming down the chimney, who had loved ones taken too soon. We especially see people angry at God for the actions of those who supposedly love him, who parade in the streets with a message of hate but a smile on their face, who love the sinner but hate the sin, and who lurk outside of abortion clinics harassing uterine individuals during already vulnerable moments in their lives. A friend of mine is a trans Muslim, and he said some days he wakes up and hates God 
mosques, churches, masjid, Muslims, and Christians. And some days he wakes up and all he wants to do is pray. I met someone just this last February, an office mate of a good friend of mine. My friend wanted her Ash Wednesday ashes and I still had some left over from an ecumenical event over at Luther House. And when I got there, I was still wearing my robes. And the first thing her friend said to me was, oh brother, forgive me father for I have sinned and rolled her eyes at me. Whenever we as people of faith meet someone who dislikes us for that faith, we are meeting someone angry, not with us, but someone angry with God himself and his so-called community. Anger is an emotion that typically comes out of the violation of boundaries, I have found. We can become angry with ourselves if we violate our own boundaries or expectations. We can become angry with others if they violate our boundaries or expectations. And we can become angry at what we fear because it too typically violates our boundaries and expectations. A lot of the anger directed at God and communities of faith is anger fruited from fear. People want to have control over what terrifies them. They'll get angry, mean, and snappy to say, please don't hurt me again like how I let you all those years before. Understandably so. People are terrified of a God that would let them be abused. A God who supposedly will punish you for swearing in a church, but doesn't mind when a group of white men put on white hoods and burn crosses in the front yards of vulnerable black and brown individuals. Many of these people who see the darkness of this world and the seeming inaction of a God who would, they would do everything in their power to make the world a better place if they had a fraction of the divine power that God is purported to hold. So they ask, why God? And they are met with deafening silence. The idea of being angry with God is not something that we really give ourselves room for. I would wager many of us, me included, can get uncomfortable directing any kind of negativity towards divinity. It feels a little blasphemous in all honesty to harbor anger against God. On desiringgod.org, a querent by the name of Brian asked the host and columnist, Pastor John, a question about the very topic we are discussing. Dear Pastor John, thank you for the podcast. I'm wondering if we can be honestly angry at God for things that happen to our lives, or is such a response out of the question? And Pastor John replies to Brian. The short answer is no, never. It is never right, never good, never virtuous, never merely neutral to fear anger at God, never. Pastor John continues cementing his point, calling up Romans 9, verses 18 through 20. So here's a situation where a human watches God and does not like what he sees. And Paul doesn't say it makes him angry. He says that it makes him question God. Who can resist your will? Why do they still find fault? Why have you made me like this? And Paul responds to this kind of questioning of God with, Who do you think you are? Oh man, to get in God's face about the way he acts. That's a pretty strong rebuke. So if Paul says that the mere words of questioning God are out of place, what would he say if those questioning words were enforced with strong emotion and anger? He would say they're doubly out of place and it's not right for a creature to call into question his maker and doubly wrong for a creature to back that up with the force of an emotional no to God. Whoa, it seems like that question terrified Pastor John. It seems like his feelings are not so dissimilar from the people who fear God and grow angry. After all, the Bible is very clear, isn't it? Proverbs 3, 7, be not wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord and depart from evil. 
Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Proverbs 10.27, the fear of the Lord prolongs days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. Do you see the picture? We have three recorded fear responses, fight, flight, or freeze. However, they've recently actually added a fourth, to fawn, to become doting, obedient, and sweet towards the source of your fear. Perhaps that's the kind of obedience that is being demanded of us biblically, like Pastor John espouses. I must disagree vehemently with Pastor John, however, because I cannot get over how utterly abusive that sounds. And in the Amplified Bible translation, 2 Timothy 1, verse 7, it says, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, of cowardice, of craven and cringing and fawning fear, but he has given us a spirit of power and of love and of calm and well-balanced mind and discipline and self-control. Being encouraged to fear an authority that should love you unconditionally is not what God made us to do. When we fear our parents more than we love them, we leave them behind. There comes a point when duty, obligation, and guilt just don't cut it in that relationship. And just as a parent is the maker of their child, we are in similar relationship to creator as parent of our souls. And in all relationships, we have expectations, needs, and wants that must be met. I need you all to go back in time with me for a moment, become a child again. Some of us in here are already still children. The sights, the smells, everything is how you left it. Now I need you to imagine your parents were superheroes, powers and all. Yet with all those powers, when you ask them to keep you safe, they let you fall. When you ask them to feed you, they let you starve. You'd start to get a little resentful at them, wouldn't you? In fact, you wouldn't even be just a little bit resentful. You'd become resentful at yourself. You'd think something was wrong with you. You'd start to think you deserve the bad things coming your way, the suffering that you endured. Some of us don't need an imaginary scenario to be resentful, especially at our parents. They did fine all on their own, working on building that resentment for years. For many people, the exact scenario that I painted is their relationship with God. They become resentful and bitter and angry with God, ultimately because of their own humanity is seen as a mistake. Their wants are sinful, their identity is sinful. It's like you can't make any mistake or you're in the wrong, supposedly, by the decree of the literal creator of everything to ever exist. They can't save everybody, but God could. They weren't able to protect themselves as children from the bad things that happened, but God could. They can't do anything about all the unfairness in the world, but God could. And because they are angry with God, they are angry with themselves, their mortality and self. And so instead of lamenting their own powerlessness, their own humanness, these angry people throw their anger at the foundation of a corrupt church and a God who appears to support it. These expectations that we have of God that are not met are seemingly many. The life of loved ones being cut short too soon, unforeseen and untimely health complications, or even the general state of the world, past or present. As a descendant of chattel slavery, I've been wounded on behalf of my ancestors wondering, why didn't you save my people? I've been wounded on behalf of the queer community wondering, why do you let these churches propped up on hate and violence continue to make the world a more unsafe place for my rainbow family? And the answer to this for many is anger, which turns into resentment because resentment is anger that's not allowed to speak. Now, the bad news is that you might be angry, resentful, and bitter at God. But the good news is that you're angry, resentful, and bitter at God. Those emotions can only exist 
where passion lives, where love hides. Because the true enemy of divine connection is not anger, but indifference. We are in relationship with God, which means that after we feel our anger, allay our confusion and dread, we must let God speak as well. Because the difference in holding a grudge and being angry is vast. I assure you, one of those takeaways, one of those takes away more energy than the other. Something particularly human is that after not talking to God for a long time, we expect them to show up with a big bouquet of roses, chocolate bonbons, and the winning numbers to the lottery. But mostly, it's going to be subtle. God speaks to us in the turning on of the radio when your favorite song just started, finding parking spaces in crowded parking lots, getting all the green lights on the way home from work. Now, for some, God knows that the only way the people will listen is if God dropped 10 tons of metric obvious in their lap, giving dreams, visions, epiphanies, or other miraculous things. But regardless of if it's big or small, God's speaking. And when speaking, God is saying, I am so sorry. I, my followers, or the world you live in made you feel unheld made you feel unsafe, broke you, or took more than it gave, because my love for you is as eternal as I am, and nothing in this dimension or any realities beyond it could ever make me hate you. And don't you worry about your mom, your brother, your uncle, or sister who's sick, because they've already been healed. And don't you worry about the ones who have passed on because they are here with me in heaven celebrating. And don't you worry about your car payment or house payment because it's been handled. Don't you worry about the people in Congo, Sudan, Haiti, or Palestine because my justice is finding them. And don't you worry about a tiny, inconsequential orange troglodyte that likes to role play as the ruler of the free world <laughs> and the Jesus Christ of white supremacy because by this summer... June through August of 2024, mark my words, he will be dealt with. Because the God I know is not a tyrannical king with an ego who can't say sorry. The God I know knows when things are too much to bear. The God I know sends their angels all over the world who minister that holy grace over everything in creation, bringing justice, balance, harmony, and love. Because God is good. So be angry. Get mad when people earnestly pray. Make fun of how hokey some sacred music sounds. Pretend you're superior to people of faith. Say you're a part of the church of the flying spaghetti monster. And when you're done, when you've let that anger flow through you, I need you to tap back into your heart, into your spirit. We as a society are too caught up in the dogma of materialism, the written word, and an enlightenment made from the visions of colonizers. We push the idea of God speaking to us through books and words and thoughts, but God is still speaking in your heart. God is speaking when you feel the warmth well up inside of you, and you feel that presence, and you may want to deny it. You may want to call it collective effervescence or something like it. But material explanation does not excuse the miracle of God. Never stop feeling God. Never stop feeling, because you never know when God may choose to write a soliloquy in the chambers of your heart. So let the people say amen. amen.
as a part of my time with you for the four months that Pastor Sue is away, we're focusing on our spiritual lives, particularly around the issue of Sabbath, but also what I wanted to do was to help you have some tools for when you are angry, for when life does feel like it's falling apart. And so for the month of April, we looked at the tool of Scripture, and I encouraged you to memorize. We used 1 Corinthians 13, but I still encourage you to find passages of Scripture. Write them in your journals that were given to you at the beginning of our time. Mark them. Memorize them. Because there may be a time when you can't get to your phone and look up Bible Gateway, or a time when you just need to calm yourself down. And those words of our sacred text can do that. So that was for the month of April. For the month of May, I want to talk to you about the tool of prayer. And I want to, each Sunday, give you a different kind of prayer or a different way of praying. Beginning this Sunday, I would like to share with you a prayer of bowing to the four directions or to four parts of nature. And it's, I do it every morning when I'm out with my dog. And it was really funny this morning because I was really in my head about today's worship and getting things ready. And my dog literally stopped where we always stop to do this and kind of was like, it's time. <laughs> so my dog was my spiritual guide this morning to remind me of prayer. Um, this is a prayer we've actually prayed together before. I invite you to stand. April, do you have the slide? So we'll start by, um, I will turn and face the direction that you're facing. And we will bow to the sky, thanking God for both light and darkness. Then we'll turn this way. And we will bow to the river, remembering that all things are flowing. Then we'll turn and face, you'll have your back towards me. And we bow to the mountain, standing upon God's faithfulness. And one more turn. And with this one, we bow to a tree, remembering to stay connected to all things in love. So these are values of mine that I share with you. To remember to stay connected to the things in our lives that are love. To remember to stand upon God's faithfulness, not our own. To remember to recognize that even though it doesn't look like it, all things are flowing. And I've forgotten the last one. River, mountain, sky. Oh, tree we did. Sky. <laughs> thank you, April. The tree, I mean the sky, to remember to thank God for both light and darkness. Thank you. And you may be seated as we move into our time of prayer. Just what it means to try to heal a world split open. Teach us what it means to try to share another's pain. One heart suffers, all creation cries. Teach us what. In Wayne Muller's book, How Then Shall We Live, he writes about going to the San Domingo Pueblo at Easter to see the corn dances. He writes that a dear friend from the Pueblo explained that for the Pueblo people, dances are prayers to the Great Spirit, to Mother Earth, to Father Sky. When we dance, we dance our love, our thanks for the many gifts from the Spirit of the Earth. What if the weather is horrible, we asked. We will dance, she said. Whatever the weather, how can the rain stop our prayers? What would our prayers be worth if we only prayed when it was good weather? How can rain or snow stop our love? We enter into our time of prayer, understanding it is one expression of love. Prayer is our dance of gratitude and our plea 
for guidance offered to a God who loves it when we pray. So let us join our hearts together in prayer. Great spirit of the dance, we come into your presence thanking you for the gifts of this day. For blue skies and breakfast in the pantry. For the love and support of friends and family. For the power of hope and the blessings of love. We honor your divine spirit that guides and comforts and challenges. We thank you for mercy and grace and the surprises of your tender presence, reminding us we are not alone. Mistakes have been made this week, and we confess that we often acted or spoken from places in our spirit that are not held in love or kindness. We have said things we wish we could take back. Missed opportunities to show friendship, nursed grudges, and at times didn't speak up when we felt the call to do so, and often spoke endlessly of things that do not matter. We have been careless with our attention and our consumption, and we have not always practiced generosity. So for the things we have done that threaten our relationships with the earth and with others, thereby distancing ourselves in our connection to you, we humbly ask for mindfulness of our thoughts and actions and for forgiveness so that we can begin again. We pray for the world in travail, for children without food or care, for those striving just to find a meal or a safe place to land, for those pushed to depths of sadness and despair and cannot see their way up. For the prisoner and the addict, the one struggling with mental health issues. For the lonely, the stranger, the weary, the lost, and the troubled. We pray for us all. We pray for the places on earth ravaged by climate change, for the seas and the air and the land and all that creeps and lumbers and flies and swims under our stewardship, so many deeply harmed by our choices of greed and carelessness. We pray for members of our community, for Carolyn and Steve and their family, for Anna, Judy, Chris, Sandy, Julian, and Fan, for Cheryl, Carissa, Stephen, Karen, Mike, Hannah, Mandy, Colton, Lori, and John, Amos, and Robin, Ree, Chilla, and Jesse, Colleen, Madison, and her parents, and Gwyneth. We seek your guidance in our choices. We seek your comfort in our sorrow. We seek your challenge where we have become indifferent. Open our hearts to the places of beauty and suffering and hold us in your love. And as we raise our voices together to pray the Jesus prayer, may our hearts be intent on their words. Our creator who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We take an opportunity as a part of our time of worship, of sharing our gifts, recognizing that when we give, we are also then blessed in return. This church is involved in so many things, and so we certainly need your pledge and your co financial commitment to help us to be able to do the work that we have been called to do. And as I always like to remind you, God loves a cheerful giver.
gracious God, all that we are and all that we have, we bring to you. In your many names we pray. Amen. This is the table of grace and mercy. I think when this table was first set, there was at least one angry person there. Judas was certainly angry at Jesus. Things had not turned out the way that Judas wanted. Jesus was not the man he was hoping he would be. And so I think he was eaten up with anger. What is beautiful about this table is that Jesus knew it. I think he knew what was about to happen, and still he shared those gifts with his enemy, with this one that he loved before he became his enemy. Even to him he said, this bread that I break and shed with you, this is my body broken for you. I love you. And in the same way, took wine and poured it and said, this is my blood spilled in a new covenant for you. Even though you're so angry, you cannot even look at me. I love you. Let us pray. Blessed are the sources of life that bring forth grain from the earth. Blessed is Mother Earth who offers her body that we may be fed. May we be nourished and may the strength we receive be used to heal ourselves, heal the earth and heal all the family of the earth. Blessed are heaven and earth, the sources of all life, who offers us the fruits of the vine. May we find in this act of drinking the grateful humility to accept all the sorrows and joys we have been given. And as we drink, may we find rest for our souls. Amen. The table here at First Congregation First Congregational is open to all seeking to live your lives in love. We invite our servers to come forward, and we understand by sharing the broken bread, we are renewed and made whole, and by sharing the cup, we are reconciled with God and with each other. All things are ready. Come and enjoy the gifts of grace. Take both of them? Okay. Come, come, come to the table.
Let us pray. God, life is hard. And so many of us this morning are struggling with something that maybe we haven't even shared with anyone. And so today we take these gifts because we need reminders that we are not alone. We need strength. We need grace. So thank you for these gifts. And may they encourage us and strengthen us to be able to go through the week ahead, walking with our chins held high, knowing that we are your beloved. And because of that, all things shall be well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As a part of our time of communion during our four months together, I wanted to offer to you the gift of anointing. So in our final hymn, I'll be standing over here in this corner. So if you would like to come for prayer, for healing, please come forward while we're singing together. Would you stand and let us sing? Fruit. 
gathered friends, on this day, know that no matter what is in your heart, no matter what you are feeling or how you are feeling it, you are loved indescribably, infinitely, and powerfully by God and all those with you. And by the grace of God, go forward on this day, not in anger, but in forgiveness. Amen. Thank you.